all of you that are present in the building to please take out that Connect card from your order of worship uh, and, and put your name on there. Let us know that you are worshiping with us today because it's real easy for us to get confused about when we saw somebody when, and it really helps us out. We want to we know that you were here. If you're a guest with us, uh, we'd like a little bit more information, uh, more than just a name. If you'll put down an email address or some way we can contact you, we would love to send a note to you and thank you for worshiping with us and answer any questions you might have about our church. So I want to ask everybody to please fill that out. And it, it, you just don't have any idea how helpful this is to me and Matt and Ben in, in the church office. On the other side of that are some sign-up opportunities. Uh, ben is now looking for some donations for that Upward Awards Night. That will be here uh, in uh, the first Saturday of March, coming up pretty quick. Uh, also, we are needing some help with the front desk uh, during the day. So we've got morning and afternoon shifts that if you've got some free time one day a week, you'd like to come and sit, answer the phone, greet people as they come in the building. Uh, we certainly could use your help, and maybe that's something you'd be willing to learn more about. And then you'll see also on there Wild Game Supper. So we are prayerfully considering hosting a Wild Game Supper again next year. It's been a while since we've done that. If that's something that piques your interest, you want to find out how you can help out with that in some way, just check off right there, and we're going to put that list together and contact those people to kind of help us uh, judge and assess the interest and, and how much uh, people are willing to help be a part of a ministry like that. Um, I want you to also notice the Wednesday night supper menu is not the same for this Wednesday as it was in the, in the Cornerstone newsletter. So we've had to make a change. So take note of that, that this Wednesday it's Hawaiian teriyaki chicken salad, which sounds delicious. So I hope you will join us for supper and Bible study on Wednesday night. When you're finished with this, you can fold that in half, drop it in an offering box as you leave, or just leave it there on your pew cushion, and we'll pick it up at the end of the service. Inside your order of worship, I do want to point out, uh, of course, the registration's already closed for this, but just a reminder, Young at Heart is 11 o'clock uh, this Tuesday. We've got Ash Wednesday coming up a week from Wednesday. I hope you'll come be a part of that very special service. And then on the 24th, we're going to be hosting the Triumphant Quartet here in concert. And uh, tickets are free, uh, so you come, enjoy that, spread the word, and uh, we'll have a great time worshiping God together in music. With that being said, let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, we are thankful for this opportunity to worship you. God, as we gather here together to hear your word read and preached, to sing and lift our voices together in unison, Father, as we bring praise and glory to your name. And we do pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would be at work in each of our hearts, God, to draw us closer to you, to reveal to us what you would have us to do as we go into this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And you might notice, if you've looked ahead in the passage on the armor of God, that some of what we're singing today would probably make just as much sense if we sang it next week. But I'm just going to be honest, I needed to sing these songs this week. So let's stand together and let's worship Jesus together. <laughs>
song for us. That song they knew, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, very well. But another song that just should encourage us this morning about God's love for us. of children, I pray that y'all believe that because it's true, everything they sang, and it's true for them, it's true for us, it's true for everyone who's come to God through Jesus for salvation. Let's stand together. We're going to sing one more song that puts our faith, our hope in God and what he said to us, and we're going to claim that and we're going to ask for his help to live that. Let's sing this together.
come and read God's word for us. Our Old Testament reading is Psalm 1 and 119, 105. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Our New Testament reading is Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. You can all have a seat. Will you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would unite our church as children of God. I pray you would set us apart from the rest of the world and set us to a higher standard that we may yield spiritual fruit by spreading your compassion. So when the world sees us, they may recognize the face of God. We thank you for all the opportunities you've bestowed upon our church to minister to your people. May we view that not as simply a charity, but as an obligation to amplify your glory. Amen.
boys and girls, come on up. Security team, it's okay. This is planned. All right. <laughs> it's good to see you all. You know, going through this armor of God's been a lot of fun for me, bring helmets and swords and stuff up here, so. Oh, yeah. Need, okay. I meant to grab that. It's good to see you all. All right, boys and girls, we have been going through the armor of God that's talked about in Ephesians, and this is the last part of the armor of God. Now, coming, uh, like all the other things I've talked about has really been to protect you, defend, you know, a shield, the helmet, the breastplate, all that stuff put together is really for our defense, and it stands for other things that we've talked about. Uh, now, the very last one that's in there is a sword, and I... I like swords. There, there was one time, I was about your all's age, and uh, at Disney, and there was the sword in the stone, and they had a little program, and I got selected to go up there, and I'd, I'd seen all these adults try to lift this sword, and I, you know, they did Disney magic, and I got to lift the sword. I didn't get to keep the sword. I really wanted to keep the sword, but they didn't let me, and it kind of looks like this. Uh, this is one of our swords that we use just as a prop that the Roman guards use in our drive through nativity. And I won't take the whole, well, yeah, let's take the whole thing out. But this sword um, is not sharp at all. I mean, the only danger from this sword, it's very dull, um, so it's not sharp like you, you read about in the Bible. The only danger here is if you, it's kind of heavy. If you drop it on your toe, that wouldn't feel good. But in the Bible, it talks about the Word of God is kind of like a sword. Now, how is it like a sword? So our Word from God is kind of like that. And we really see this, I think a clear example, is when Jesus goes out into the wilderness, and it's before his ministry starts, and Satan comes, the devil shows up, and he tempts Jesus. And, and the devil actually takes some scripture, but he doesn't use it right, he uses it incorrectly. And he's using it to try to get Jesus to do things that he shouldn't do, to, uh, to, to test God and do, do all these other things that Jesus shouldn't do. And what Jesus does, he knows the Bible. He knows Scripture. He is God. And uh, he uses Scripture correctly to kind of, as kind of a defense, but as attack back on, on Satan. And he does that a, couple, a few times, three times, and then the devil d just leaves. And uh, so what he did was he used the Word of God to help protect himself and, to pr and attack Satan back, really, uh, from temptation. So what that means is, when we're when when we're tempted, what's that? I like God. You like God? I like God too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we use the, like how? Where do I go from there? All right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you use God's word to um, uh, when when you're tempted, maybe do something wrong. You can remember things that you know about God's word. And it's a two-edged sword, so it's, it's to fight back Satan, but it also cuts deep into us. It's used to correct us. It's used to teach us, and it's used for a lot of things. So I'm not talking about a real sword, but this is a powerful weapon. This is a powerful weapon because it helps protect us. It helps us to teach others. It helps us to correct others and to correct ourselves, okay? We've got to do that just as much, if not more, uh, from God's Bible. So this is really important to always have with us. And to memorize scripture is a good way. That's one thing we're trying to do as uh, a church with a verse that we got from, from this, the armor of God. And I know from Teen Kid and things like that, you've had scripture memory verses. Once you have that memorized, you have it with you. You're always armed with that sword, ready to go. Okay, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this uh, time that we, uh, I've had with these boys and girls this, these weeks and talking about the armor of God. Lord, I just pray over them, uh, Lord, that they can make that decision for you. Some of them have, some of them will. And uh, Lord, we pray for that day and, and pray that they can be fully equipped uh, with your armor and with your sword, God's word, Lord, that is active. It is for us. It's for everyone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, kids, you are now invited to, to Children's Church, twos and threes in the nursery area, and then K-5 first, uh, first grade in the uh, chapel.
Thank you, Ben. As Ben said, we are nearing the end of this sermon series on the full armor of God. We've got one more uh, message next week to wrap us up with this. Uh, and today we come to the last piece of the armor. But we started this back at the 1st of January, talking about the reality of spiritual warfare, that we are in a battle against forces of darkness, against the unseen realm, against uh, powers and authorities, uh, even in the, in the heavenly realms that, that are at war with God. And we read about that in the Old Testament, the book of Job, and different places in the book of Revelation. And uh, sometimes it's kind of hard to wrap our minds around that because we aren't talking about flesh and blood. We're not talking about other people. We're talking about the devil at work and his demons in ways that we often can't see, but we can feel. And we know we're there when we're honest. And so Paul tells us we've got to learn to identify this enemy. We've got to familiarize ourselves with his tactics, with his schemes and his strategies. And we spent some time doing that. And then we look at the armor of God, this spiritual armor that God has gifted to us. He's given us these pieces. But it's our responsibility to take them up, to put them on, all of them, to wear them properly every single day as we go out into the battle around us. And as Ben said, everything we've looked at so far have been primarily defensive, right? These, it's, it's an armor. It's something you wear to protect you, to help you to defend yourself against attacks. But now we come to the only primarily offensive piece, and that is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We're going to look at this sword of the Spirit today. And as we look at this... We're not gonna, I'm not going to follow the same pattern I've done before. We're not going to look any, at any specific schemes or strategies of Satan. I think we've covered all of those pretty well in looking at the defensive pieces. Today we're going to look at a different aspect of our strategy. So far, the strategy that we've, we've learned is very simple for us. In this spiritual battle, with this armor on, our strategy is simply stand firm. Hold your ground. Resist the devil withstand his schemes and his attacks, stand firm. But now we have something offensive. We have something that, like Ben said, not only can defend us, but we can use to go on the attack. And so now we have a different strategy in, hand, in mind. Now let's think about that sword. Uh, what sword was Paul thinking of? It's not, you know, what Ben out, had out here, that's a pretty good-sized sword, but it's not like those... You know, big, heavy, long swords you think of like King Arthur and his knights having, you know, that takes both hands to wield. No, this is the Roman gladius. It's a double-edged short sword that the Roman legionnaires would carry. It's something they could hang on their, on their belt pretty easily. They could bring it out, and it was good to use in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So keep that in mind as we go through this together. And I want us to begin by doing uh, what we did uh, uh, several weeks ago. I want us to read together the passage of Scripture that I hope you're working on committing to memory. Okay, So let's read this passage of Scripture together. For this reason, take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for Your Word and we're thankful for the gift of this armor. And we pray, God, that You would guide us now as we discover more about this sword of the Spirit and how we can effectively use it in the war against Satan and his forces. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so let's first of all think about why did Paul use a sword to be the analogy for the Word of God, and why is it the sword of the Spirit? Let's think about that, uh, that 
sword of the Spirit. In 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul writes, All Scripture is inspired by God. Now, if you're reading the NIV, it defines for us what that word inspired means. It'll say that all Scripture is God-breathed. Inspired, God-breathed, and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. Now, this idea of the inspiration of Scripture, that, that the Word of God is breathed out by God, What that means is even though God used humans to write down the words of the Bible, He is the ultimate source of the words and the truth that we read in Scripture. They are breathed out by God. Now what's interesting is that the Greek and Hebrew words, remember the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek, both the Hebrew and Greek word for spirit is the same word for breath or wind. It's the word ruach in uh, Hebrew and pneuma in Greek. And both of those mean spirit, means breath, means wind. That's why when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he uses the wind as an analogy for the Holy Spirit. And so if the Word of God is breathed out by God, in other words, it's inspired by God's Spirit. God's Spirit is who gives the words of the Bible, truth and meaning and power and authority in our lives, then it makes sense to think of the Bible as the sword of the Spirit because the Bible is of the Spirit of God. Paul, there in 2 Timothy 3, he's talking about the final product. All Scripture is inspired. It's been inspired. Peter says the same thing, talking about the process the process of inspiration. In 2 Peter 1, he says, because no prophecy ever came by the will of men. In other words, when you read the Bible, this isn't just Moses' ideas. This isn't just David's or Samuel's or or Solomon's or, or Matthew's ideas. It's not by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So how is the Spirit, how is the Word of God inspired? It's inspired because the Holy Spirit inhabited and wrote and worked through these men as they wrote the words of Scripture. And since the Bible is the divinely inspired Word of God, and it truly conveys God's voice to us, reveals God's character and mind to us, then shouldn't this book shape and inform every aspect of our lives? Shouldn't it guide our decisions and inform our thoughts, and permeate our speech? Isn't this a formidable weapon to use against Satan's schemes? As Ben so wonderfully pointed out, uh, that's what Jesus himself used. Jesus did not overcome Satan's temptations because he is God in human flesh. He is God in human flesh. But he did not use that supernatural ability to defeat Satan. In fact, that's what Satan was tempting him to do was to rely on his divinity to provide for him bread to eat and to save himself by throwing himself down off the temple. No, Jesus used the same thing you and I have access to to defeat Satan, the Word of God. And Jesus defeated Satan with Scripture to show us that we too can defeat Satan with Scripture. Remember what I said before, though. The primary battlefield for this spiritual war is not out there. And we do not fight against flesh and blood. Rather, the primary battlefield is here and here. It's within us. And so as Ben pointed out, that is a double-edged sword. It cuts both ways. Not only can we use it to defend and attack the forces of evil out there in the world, but it also is a scalpel that can cut into our heart, that can pierce to our soul that can lay us open and expose us to the light that we need to show the sin, the doubts, the false motives, the things in our life that need to be corrected. That's why Hebrews 4, 12, and 13, we heard part of this this morning in our New Testament reading. For the Word of God is living and active. It's not a dead book. It's a living book. It's, It's full of life. It's full of power. It has the power to transform. It's active. It's working. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts 
and attitudes of the heart, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. We should come to the Bible with the full awareness that this is God's divinely inspired, infallible Word to discipline us and counsel us and teach us and train us. There should be nothing more natural than for a Christian to want to spend time in the Word of God. It should be like the air we breathe, like the water we drink, like the food that we eat. We depend on God's Word for our spiritual survival and health and growth. It has the power to equip us and to transform us. So what does the sword of the Spirit do? Well, Paul talks about this there in 2 Timothy 3.16. He outlines for us what this divinely inspired Word of God is profitable for, what it's valuable for, what does it produce, what does it do for us. And he tells us the first thing is it teaches us what is true. It teaches us what is true. In the Bible, we can learn the truth about God, about who He is, about who we are, about the world around us. The Bible reminds us that we are created in God's image and infinitely loved by our Creator. It tells us that we are all characters in His story. It's not about us. It's about Him. He's both the author and the hero of the story. He's the rescuer who has come to rescue and save His wayward people. So one way you can think about it is that the written word, the Bible, reveals the incarnate word, Jesus, to each and every one of us. It gives us as complete a picture of God as we could possibly understand. In fact, the Bible so completely describes the nature and character of God, it leaves no room for us to just come up with our own thoughts and opinions. It tells us who God is. The Bible narrates the world in which we live. It tells us where it came from, what's gone wrong with it, and where it's going. And that means that everything we deal with in this world, every issue we face in our life is addressed in this book. Our faith, our relationships, our finances, ethics, morals, all of life's most important questions and answers, find, issues find their answers in the pages of this book. It accurately explains the world in which we live, and it tells us how our lives and the world around us works best. Now, if you remember when we talked about the belt of truth and the helmet of salvation, we leaned in to how important it is for God's people to be in His Word so much to the point that His Word gets into us and guards us and protects us. It allows God's Word to work within us because the Bible is where we discover God's truth. It guards our mind. It holds all the rest of the pieces of this armor together. The truth of God is found in the Word of God. It teaches us what is true. Secondly, it rebukes sin in our lives. That word rebuke means to point out a fault. God's Holy Spirit takes God's Holy Word and points out what's unholy in us. And he rebukes us. He calls us out. Our approach to the Bible should always be informed by Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, where the psalmist says, Search me, God, and know my heart. When you open up the Bible, your prayer should be, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me, know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. That should be our attitude in prayer whenever we come to Scripture. Because God's Word isn't a sword for us to win arguments or to play gotcha with people or to manipulate others or justify ourselves. And God's Word is far more than just an intellectual pursuit so we can know stuff and win at Bible trivia. We should look to God's Word primarily so that it will look into us and change us. And that begins by rebuking the sin in our lives. If you're, listen, if you're using the Bible properly, you discover that as much as you read it, it's reading you. It's exposing the, the, the thoughts of your mind and the motives of your heart. It penetrates to the core. It exposes who you really are. And that's why a lot of people don't want to read the Bible. That's why people downplay it and deny it because... It challenges us. 
It questions our motives. It makes us uncomfortable. It challenges our assumptions, and it requires us to change. And we don't like to change, do we? It rebukes us of sin in our lives, and then when it rebukes us, it corrects us. It corrects us when we wonder, once those errors are exposed, you then have to do something about it. And when we hold up our culture's ever-changing beliefs and opinions to the unchanging truth of God's Word, we can discern the lies and the half-truths and the false narratives all around us. Satan's lies can only be exposed by God's truth. Psalm 119.9 asks, How can a young man keep his way pure? How can we live pure, holy lives? How, how can we follow the right paths? By living according to your word. It's like when a plane gets off course, right? And maybe it's even flying into the path of another plane and air traffic control says, you've got to change course now. Change to this course now. What's the plane got to do? Change course. Go a different direction to avert disaster. That's what God's Word does for us. Through it, the Spirit says, you need to change course. You're going the wrong way, and you're heading for disaster. It corrects us when we wonder, and forth, it trains us to do what is right. Paul says it's, it's profitable for training in righteousness. That, that word righteousness, he's referring to having the very mind and character of God forming within us, informing our thoughts, transforming our lives. Paul writes to the young pastor Timothy in 1 Timothy 4. He says, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And consider how much time and money and energy people put into their physical health. Right? And that's a good thing. We, we should take good care of our bodies. God gives us one we need to take good care of it, right? But how foolish for us to not put at least that much time and effort and money into our spiritual health. Because seriously, no matter what you invest in your physical health, it's only good for a limited time. It has an expiration date. But when we train ourselves for godliness, it has eternal fruit. And God has given us everything we need. He's given us the equipment. He's given us the diet. He's given us everything that we need for our spiritual training. As Peter writes in 2 Peter 1, 3-4, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. God has given us everything we need, especially the knowledge of Him, His very great and precious promises found in His Word. And through these words, we can experience freedom and, transfer, and transformation. We can experience peace and joy. We can experience the victory that Jesus says we can have through Him. So we've talked about the what and the why. What is the sword of the Spirit? What does it do? Why has God given us this? But now we need to talk about the how. The how of being trained in using God's Word. How do we use the sword of the Spirit? Well, in 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul says to Timothy, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who co correctly handles the word of truth. We have to train ourselves. We have to do our best. We have to prove ourselves through work to know how to correctly handle His word. Now, anyone who's ever been a responsible uh, owner and user of a gun or a bow and arrow, or a pocket knife, or, a, or an axe, or a saw, or anything like that, you have to be trained, right? You, you, need to, you need to understand what's the best way to use this for your own safety, for the safety of others, and so you can work and use it as efficiently and effectively as possible, right? Because if you misuse one of those things, it can have really bad results. Now, if you're like me, you have used one or more of all of those, okay? 
But if you're like me, you've never used a sword. <laughs> I've, never, I've never swung a sword at anything or anybody. Have you? We have anybody that likes to fence? Anybody in here that does that sort of thing? No, probably not. Okay, so we don't know a whole lot about using actual swords, but Roman soldiers did. Roman soldiers trained fiercely at how to best use that gladius and how to take good care of it, how to keep it sharp. Well, listen, we also need to learn how to rightly handle the word of truth. Too many Christians do not know how to use their Bibles. They don't know how to find anything in it. They don't know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. They couldn't summarize for you the story of Scripture. They don't know how to use it to resist temptation, how to answer questions and doubts, how to encourage someone else, or how to share their faith. Too many Christians are walking around with swords they don't know how to use. And far too often that results in people misusing it to harm the cause of Christ and the well-being of other people. How many people have been turned off from the church because of Christians misusing the Word of God? So I want to share with us some ways that we can get a good grip on the Word of God. You think about picking up the hilt of that sword and holding on to it correctly. And, and, and we can think of these as, the, as our fingers and our thumb and the palm of our hand and our outstretched arm. We're going to think about those things as we look at how to better grab a hold. Just, just like if you're training at using a sword, the more you use it, the better a grip you have of it, the more natural it feels, the easier it comes to you, becomes second nature. You don't even have to think about it. That's the way it should be as we use the Word of God. But unlike conventional swords that dull over time, right? The more you use a sword, the duller it gets. With the Word of God, the more you use it, the sharper it gets. You sharpen it by using it. So the first thing we have to do before we can swing a sword is we need to take it up. We need to get it in our hand, have a firm grasp of it. And in the same way, before we can use God's Word, we've got to get God's Word into our mind and into our heart, right? So the first way we do that is we hear God's Word. We hear it. Romans 10, 17, Paul says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the Word of Christ. We have to hear it. Now, for too many Christians, this is the only means of Bible intake. The only way they get the Bible is because they listen to a preacher preach about it. Maybe they go to a Sunday school class and hear it taught, and that's it. Okay, so we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But it is a valuable way to encounter God's Word, to hear it. You think about it, when the Bible was written, it was written to people that did not have ready access. Right? Everything's written on scrolls and parchment. A lot of people couldn't even read. And so... Reading God's Word at home was not an option. You had to come to a synagogue or to a church to hear God's Word read publicly. That's, what, that's how it was written. That was the assumption of the human writers is that it would be read aloud and it would be heard. Of course, things have changed drastically. Now any one of us can read the Bible in a number of translations on our phone, right? You can go online and listen to sermons from countless preachers all over the world. So times are different. But nothing can replace, I don't believe anything can replace the experience of coming together with God's people and hearing the Word of God spoken, taught, preached publicly by people that know you and love you and care about you and know what you're going through and that you can sit down over a cup of coffee with and talk about it. Amen. Nothing can replace that. N nothing can take the place of a small group Bible study where you are reading and studying and hearing God's Word taught with people that you know and love and you can see how the Word of God is speaking into their lives and helping them deal with different issues and you guys can struggle through the questions together. It's powerful. But the key is whenever we hear God's Word, whether it's through a sermon or a Sunday school lesson, is we've got to be active participants. It's a participatory experience. The more you put into it, the more you get out of it. So I hope that when you're here listening to a sermon, I hope you've got your Bible open, you've got your pen in your hand, you've got those sermon notes taking notes. And I pray, and maybe it's naive of me to think y'all do this, but I pray that at some point during the week, you pull out those notes and you look at them and you reread that passage of Scripture. If you want to bless this preacher's heart, do that this week. Amen. We need to hear God's Word. Secondly, we read God's Word. It's not just enough to hear it. 
We need to read it. 1 Timothy 4, 13, Paul says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. So Paul is saying that in addition to preaching and teaching God's Word, it needs to be read publicly. And again, for a lot of people, the only way they could read God's Word is when people read it publicly. So we can interpret that to our day and our situation that Paul is saying... Hearing the Bible preached and taught is important, but it's equally important that you read it. Read the Bible for yourself. We need to personally take time to spend in Scripture. And for you, maybe that means you do a year-long Bible reading plan, okay, where you're reading through the Bible in a year. Maybe you, maybe you change Bibles. You do a different translation each year. Maybe one year you said, I'm going to read it chronologically. And it, maybe you're going to focus a year on the Old Testament or you're on the New Testament. Or maybe for you, you've just got one of those really good devotional books that has a passage of Scripture for you to read and a little bit of commentary and a, and a prayer to pray. Whatever you use, it's important you spend some time with God in His Word every single day. What does it mean to read the Bible devotionally? We talk about having devotions. It means that you are devoting yourself to listening to God speak to you through His Word. It means that you are devoting yourself to be eager to learn what He is saying to you in that moment. The longest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119, and it's an entire chapter about devoting yourself to the Word of God. It talks about the person who does that, that their love for Scripture is so great that they've got such a hunger and thirst for it. And it talks about the difference that it makes in their life, that it's a lamp for their feet and a light for their path, that they hide God's Word in their heart, that they won't sin against God. Are you devoted to the Word of God? Listen, I'm not saying you've got to spend an hour every day. If, you, if we all in this room just spent at least 15 minutes a day in the Word of God, I think we'd be amazed at how it would transform our lives, our church, and our community. Amen. Just 15 minutes a day even, reading God's Word. I think you'll discover it is a spiritually rewarding, enjoyable experience that makes an eternal difference in your life. So we hear God's Word, we read God's Word, but don't stop there. We need to study God's Word. We need to do more than just a passing read. We need to dig into it. One of the places that Paul on one of his missionary journeys stopped was in northern Greece, a, a town called Berea. And listen to uh, Luke's description of the people there in Acts 17.11. He says, Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. They didn't just hear it. They didn't just read it, they examined it. They dug into it. God wants you to do more than just listen to a sermon or spend you know, a few minutes reading a, a devotional and then just say, amen, that was good, and move about your day. As if nothing happened and nothing changes. He expects you to dig in and discover for yourself what the Bible says. We need to be like the Bereans. We need a good, do a good dose of humility and of curiosity about God's Word. Now, I could spend days talking about all the different ways you can study the Bible, but this morning I just want to offer a simple one, a series of questions, right? That's how the Bereans, what did the Bereans do? They had questions. They had questions about what Paul was saying. They looked to God's Word to see if what he said was true. So I want to, in your notes, you'll see there just a list of some simple questions. If you read a passage of Scripture, ask yourself, what is this passage teaching me about God? What is it teaching me about myself? What is it teaching me about the world? Is there a promise here to claim? Is there a command here to obey? Is there an example for me to follow or not follow, as sometimes is the case? Is there a sin in my life that this verse is pointing out that I need to confess and turn from? Listen, if you spend 15 minutes a day reading a passage of Scripture, thinking about those questions... Right? You, you get a notepad and a pen. Write down your answers to those questions. Write down any observations you make, anything that jumps off the page of you, any connection that God is helping you make in your mind. You'll be well on your way to really enjoying the, the richness and the depth of God's Word in, in Bible study. And I encourage you to get a good study Bible that's got notes in it. Get, a, get a, a Bible handbook or a Bible dictionary. And listen, Ben or Matt or I'd be more than glad to recommend some of these to you. 
If you're reading through a particular book of the Bible, we've got commentaries in our library that you can check out and use to help you answer questions, things you don't understand. What is this talk about? I don't understand this. There are resources out there. There are some good online resources as well. Uh, the Bible Project, their videos and study guides are phenomenal. Uh, the YouVersion app on your, on your phone or Bible.com on the Internet, you know, those are both the same thing. They are full of reading plans and devotionals and study guides. And, and so those are some great tools at your disposal. So first, we've got to get God's Word into our lives. We do that by hearing it, reading it, studying it. But once it's in there, then what do we do with it? Well, the next thing we need to do is memorize God's Word. Memorize God's Word. Psalm 119.11, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So when we, when we memorize God, God's Word, it guards our minds against temptation. You know what else it does? When you memorize God's Word, you are able to share God's Word with anybody, anywhere, anytime. You meet people and you have opportunities to encourage someone, to help somebody in some way, God will have that word ready for you. In fact, Jesus said in John 14, 26, He made us a promise that the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He said, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. But before the Spirit can remind us of something, what do we have to do? Get it in there, right? We've got to read it. We've got to study it. We've got to memorize it. I want to challenge you. Identify some Bible verses you'd like to memorize. And you don't have to memorize one a day. Start with one a week. Take a verse, split it in two. I'm going to memorize half of it this week, half of it next week. Do it at your pace. Okay? We're not in a competition here. And I want to encourage you to work toward memorizing longer passages of Scripture like the Lord's Prayer, Psalm 1, Psalm 23. The spiritual armor, right? We're doing that together. Memorize one verse at a, at a time, but memorize a larger passage of Scripture. And as with any memorization, you know the key is review, 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 right? Keep going over that, and you will be so blessed. Because as you memorize God's Word, it equips you to do the next thing, to take it one step deeper from your mind into your heart, and that's to meditate on God's Word. Joshua 1.8 says, Keep this book of the law always on your lips, Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. To meditate, that Hebrew word there means to mumble, means to move your lips. That's why he says to keep the word of God on your lips and meditate on it. It means that you're repeating God's word over and over to yourself. You're preaching to yourself in effect. To meditate means to dwell on to analyze and think about, to mull it over in your mind. I like to think about it like uh, putting some dinner on in the crock pot. Any of y'all ever do that? Or your wives ever do that? I love it when Julia puts like a, like a chuck roast or a pot roast, something into the crock pot with all the vegetables, and it just sits there and it slow cooks all day long, right? You know that every bite's going to be juicy and full of flavor, and when you come in the house at the end of the day, the whole house just smells delicious, Right? When we meditate on God's Word, that's what we're doing. We're taking God's Word and we're putting it in the slow cooker of our heart and we're letting it just marinate and we're letting it just fill our lives with the aroma of God's love and God's truth. When you're driving to work, taking a shower, mowing the yard, brushing your teeth, going for a run, meditate on God's Word. Think about those verses you've been reading or memorizing. And you'll discover new applications of Scripture. You'll discover that God's Word has been marinating in your heart and it turns into worship and praise. It turns into prayer and conviction. It turns into a course of action that can change your life or the life of others. And we do that. We memorize it. We meditate on it. We take it from our mind to our heart so that it can go to our hands, so that we can obey God's Word so we can live it out, so that we can do what it says. Listen, don't fall into the trap of thinking that the end goal of Bible study is the acquisition of information. No, the point of Bible reading and Bible study is for spiritual transformation. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If we're not putting into practice what we're learning... 
If we're not reading God's Word with love for Him and for others to do what it says, then we're just going to become puffed up hypocrites who know a lot about the Bible but don't know how to live it. And a and hypocrite is not a Christian who sins or isn't perfect, right? Being a Christian is not about being perfect. None of us are perfect, are we? So an imperfect Christian is not a hypocrite. No, a hypocrite is someone who claims to have knowledge of God but refuses to live by it. Amen. That's a hypocrite. And Jesus addressed the hypocrites of His day, the Pharisees, in John 5 when He said, You diligently study the Scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the Scriptures that testify about Me, yet you refuse to come to Me to have life. Listen, the solution to hypocrisy isn't to study the Bible less is to apply the Bible more. Amen. It's to do what it says. If you're reading the Bible, but you're not applying it to your own life, you're mishandling Scripture. It's not nearly as important that you have lots of knowledge about the Bible as that you obey the commands that God gives you, that you live your life based on the promises that God gives you. Remember in James 1, he compared looking at God's Word and not doing it to a man who looks in the mirror and walks away and forgets what he looked like. Because like a mirror, the Word of God has the ability to reveal to us what's wrong in our life so that we'll do something about it, so that we'll correct it. Listen, God isn't impressed because you read the Bible through in a year. There's no honor badge for doing that, okay? Okay? What God cares about is that you spend time in His Word because you love Him and you let it change you from the inside out. That's what God wants. Amen. And whether you spend an hour or 15 minutes a day doing that, that's not what matters. Bible study is incomplete and illegitimate if it doesn't lead us to obedience and transformation. We need to read God's Word. Pray about it. Live it out in obedience. And finally... We've got that firm grip now. We're, we're hearing, we're reading, we're studying, we're memorizing and meditating on and obeying the Word of God. And the last thing we do is we extend that hand out and we share God's Word with others. Amen. In Philippians 2, Paul tells us to shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the Word of life. How selfish would I be if I knew how to help you solve a problem, but I didn't bother to help you or tell you how to do it? Imagine you're stuck on the side of the road. Your car won't start. Smoke is billowing out from under the hood. You don't know what to do about it. I come driving by now. I'm no mechanic <laughs> by, by any stretch of the imagination. But let's say I've been right where you are. Let's say I've had the same thing happen to me, and I've got a pretty good idea of what probably is wrong and how to fix it. And I don't stop to help you. What's that make me? Makes me a jerk, doesn't it? <laughs> No, I should stop and help you, not because I'm an expert, but because I've been there. Listen, you don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to have a seminary degree to share God's Word with other people. Right. You go to other people that are, that are struggling in ways you've struggled. You go to people and you share with them the truth that's helped you, and you say, this might be something that would help you because it helped me. And we share God's Word with others. Now listen. You know how to use the Word of God. You know what the Word of God can do. Our challenge as we go into this week is to do it. It's to obey God's truth. I've shared it. You've heard it. Will you meditate on it this week? Will you obey it? I want to challenge you this week. Even if you just said, I'm going to step up my engagement with God's Word, I'm just going to increase it by 10% this week. I think you'd be amazed at the difference it makes in your life, in our church, and in our community. Okay? That's your challenge. Now, the first truth of God's Word that we should all obey, the most important truth of God's Word that we should share with others, is the gospel. Is the truth that God loves you so very much that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to live a sinless life die a perfect spotless death on the cross of Calvary to pay the price for your sins. Amen. To purchase salvation for you. Because we're all sinners. None of us are perfect. And we need the mercy and the grace of God. If you've never put your trust in Jesus 
If you've never said, God, I'm a sinner, and, and I know that I've hurt you with my sin, but I want to turn away from my sin. I want you to forgive me, and I want to turn to you, Jesus. I'm going to trust in you to forgive me. Give me eternal life and help me live for you. If you've never done that, that's the first truth of God's word. You have to obey. And I pray you would come today and say, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to follow him. I want to know that he is my Savior and that I stand right with God. You can do that today. And that is a truth that every one of us in this room that know Jesus are equipped by his word and his spirit to go out into this world this week and share with others. What I just shared with you, I didn't learn at seminary. I learned it in BBS as a kid. Amen. You've learned the same thing, and you can share it too. Let's stand together and let's pray. And I hope that you will respond this morning and come making the decision that God has laid on your heart. Father, we love you and thank you for the gift of your word. Your word is truth. Your word is power. Your word is life. God, forgive us for how quickly we are to just neglect it and to take it for granted. God, it, it contains the words of salvation. It contains the truth about you and ourself and our world. It gives us the power and, and the equipment that we need to live godly lives. Father, help us to treasure and value your word, to hunger and thirst after it, and to use it responsibly and wisely and lovingly infused by your spirit. Lord, to cut deep in us, not to cut deep in others, to defend against the lies of Satan and to advance the gospel of Christ. If there's anyone here today that needs to believe that gospel, to receive Jesus or to make public that decision that they've already done that, I pray they'd come this morning. If anyone, Father, as a, as a baptized believer but wants to unite with this church and, and, and worship together, God, I pray they would come as well. Say, I want to stand together with these fellow soldiers in the army of the Lord. God, whatever your spirit is leading, may we be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. so good to be with you in God's house today and I'll be praying for you this week as you go into this world that you would grow in your love for God's word, spend time with him, do what he says and share it with others. Uh, this afternoon at three o'clock we'll be uh, having the funeral service for Garrett Edmonds. Of course I invite you to come. Visitation will be at two o'clock in the atrium. Be in prayer for Kathy and Earl and Catherine and all that family in the days and weeks to come. Uh, and you know what? As we go today, we go in the opportunity to carry the hope and the love of Jesus Christ to hurting and to grieving people all around us. As we go, we have an opportunity to give our tithes and offerings to not only help us, but help others to do the same here in our community and around the world. So as we go, let's go with the desire to give generously, not just from our wallets or our checkbooks, but from our heart. As we go into this world that the people God has in our path. We're going to sing as we go. And hope to see you back next Sunday. Let's sing the last verse of How From Her Foundation. The soul that on Jesus.
Jesus at 